I'm John Kachoyan, Literary Manager at Australian Plays, and we're here today to talk to Wesley Enoch, the Artistic Director of the Sydney Festival. Hi, Wesley. Hi, John. How are you? Very well. Thank you for coming back. Oh, thank you for having me in your <laughs> lovely office. Uh, so tell me about 2020 and the Sydney Festival. Well, what's fascinating is that uh, when we sat down to go, how many commissions have we got for the Sydney Festival in 2020? We counted them and there are 46. Wow. Now that's a lot, over a whole range of different art forms and different ways of commissioning. But this notion of, as a maker, I've been very keen on how to support artists to take the next step. And commissioning is one of the best ways of doing it. You know, Not just Australian artists, some international artists as well. And for me, there's, uh, especially in an environment when we're talking about funding being a little bit squeezed and that the artistic ambitions of the country are feeling a bit squeezed, these large pieces of infrastructure like festivals that are very fluid can actually shift and change around the needs of um, artists and the community. So for me to go, okay, well, let's, let's jump into it. Let's mm. find out what that is. Large scale First Nations works um, the, and smaller scale as well, visual arts pieces, uh, partnerships with different organisations and companies to kind of raise things up. I've been very excited by that. And that it's not just about location, it's not just about it only has to be Sydney people and Sydney artists, but when you do have Sydney artists making work about our experience, you start to get a different kind of energy, a different a frisson, if you like. Um, and there's been a number of initiatives that we've been partnering with to make that happen. We are not the monolith, you know, <laughs> a festival, Festival can feel sometimes like this big organisation, but what we're, I think, very useful for and very good at is partnering with different people to achieve not just our own goals, but their goals as well. Mm. You said last year that maybe the festival was about an idea of safety or belonging or home. Is there any big ideas or what are the conversations with artists? Um, you know, not themes, but what are those conversations been this year as opposed to last? Yeah, themes, you know, that whole thing, I'm not, a, I'm not a great believer in themes, but what happens is that through the conversations, things start to emerge. And for me, it, it's become this, what I keep calling the threshold, people passing from one thing to another, from one understanding of the world to another, and using the arts to do it. You understand uh, a point of view, you build compassion or empathy, if you like, for another point of view through this sense of ritual or change that happens. Um, and that's that's kind of, I don't know. I, I, I like to think, I think more, I work more osmotically, mm. you know, the conversations I have, I mean, I frustrate this place no end because things come together in a, in a, in a late way. I don't kind of set a, set something early and pursue it. Mm. I kind of let things emerge. And as they're emerging, there's a real sense that we need to shift as a community. We need to make change. And that as artists, we have rituals and ceremonies to help embody that change, to, to prototype it, as I keep coming back to this idea, of, to rehearse change mm. so that the world, the audiences that are coming can connect with that change when it uh, eventuates for them. And do you think any of the international artists that you're talking to are also feeling that squeeze? Because we're, we're certainly not alone in um, the pressure cooker of the world at the moment. That's true. I think other, uh, well, depending on where, let's say in the North American context, there's not been a huge amount of funding anyway. Those artists have been a lot more um, fluid in their positions and they were able to kind of keep things going, but they're jumping on board in a big way. They're looking at trying to, to, to uh, affect change in a community through ideas. Whereas I think there's been a lot of commercial thinking up until, mm. you know, well, maybe it's still there, but this idea of going, oh, we need to shift a little bit more. In the kind of European sector, I think that, um, not there's reticence, but there, there's art for art's sake a lot more in those kind of European funded models. And so they're, they're not shifting as quickly because they feel supported. Mm. And so not that I'm saying that you should take money away from arts, or, <laughs> arts organisations or arts community, but there's something about the hunger to be as close to your community as possible and to be as relevant to your community as possible for either commercial gain or through the kind of relevance discussion that we're getting. Um, it was interesting, I was at um, an, uh, an arts event and there was, where it was mostly marketers kind of talking and they had this kind of uh, um, real-time survey mechanism. And all these marketers, when said, what is the biggest issue facing the arts? They all said relevance. 
And I go, yeah, of course marketing people think it's relevance. For us, it's resourcing, feed our voice and let our voice be heard. But for marketers, they're going, oh, how do I make it relevant to a community? And so I think that as artists, it's beholden on us to go, we are relevant when we are connected and talking about a community because we are the canaries down the coal mine, you know, to use that <laughs> metaphor, we are there already connected to the zeitgeist and that's what our job is. Yeah. Uh, you, you talk about location a bit and I think we've talked before, Sydney, there are many Sydneys and there are many places in Sydney. How do you juggle the spread and sprawl of the literal city as well as the spread and sprawl of the festival? Yeah, that's... I, I don't think I do it well because in the end you have to make decisions. Do you, do you spread thinly or do you concentrate and make hubs? Mm. And I, I'm, it, it's, it's a dilemma I don't think I've ever solved. And maybe I never will. Maybe it's not. It, but it's the pursuit of it that you kind of go for. Um, the, the geographic spread of the city is interesting because you end up wanting to work with partners. So Riverside and Parramatta, Campbelltown Arts Centre, um, uh, Bankstown Arts Centre, you know, that these centres already have communities and, and bodies of action in their community and hopefully audiences that kind of connect. So you, you connect with them first. Um, but I think that the, the cultural spread is something that I haven't got in a consistent manner. It, it goes in fits and starts, or, or perhaps we need to see them in five year cycles rather than 12 month cycles. Right. So like last festival, we had a huge array of, of different works from culturally diverse voices. There's not as many this year. And I go, oh, why is that? And you go, well, obviously because everyone galvanizes around particular projects and other, you know, and other projects then take a good 18 months, two years or longer to develop. So there are these kind of rhythms that we need to look at. And it's, it's very Western, you know, <laughs> European Western to think that everything should work in a 12 month cycle. Yeah. Whereas if you're working in the small to medium sector, you're already talking about 24 month, 36 month cycles yeah. in the development of work. And that, that we as large organizations need to accommodate that. And if you like, get the pipeline to work better. So you don't have these kind of gluts and bottlenecks and then nothing. Yeah. Or, you know, how do you keep the flow? And it's more difficult, I think, in festivals where you have very short artistic directorships. So, you know, let's say this last festival in 2019 is the closest to what I want the festival to be because it took me three years of just shifting and coaxing and massaging the system to, to get to that point. And even now in my fourth festival, having 46 commissions is mm. no accident. <laughs> it's because it's been, con the conversation's been, n but I'll be gone in 2021. Yeah. And so my successor will have to start all of that again, which I'm for, you know, like, I don't want to be around forever. But how do these organizations, large and small, get the, get the feeder, get the kind of the long arc of something that also means development can come in and out. An artist isn't, you know, strapped to a clock hmm. that they have to you know, deliver at this deadline. Because sometimes work takes a little bit longer. You know, Counting and Cracking being a good example of that. The way Shakti worked over a 10 year period for that work, that's, and made a significant contribution through that tel telling hmm. that story, as some of the things that are coming in 2020. It's interesting, we just published an essay by Emily Collier on kind of the muscularity of the mid-career, you know, that, that just as, pa as some of us are reaching you know, that kind of command, having a command of something and what, what do you lose? Um, and I think it's really interesting, how do you keep that knowledge or keep that flexibility when very often too, when people come through organisations, they have a, there's a perceived mandate or I'm cleaning house or I'm changing directions or, yeah, yeah. you know, how do you maintain balance but also be, be personal and be honest? And well, the idea that every appointment is a reaction to the one that's gone before. Like literally at Sydney Festival, it's gone Australian, international, Australian, international, Australian. And so is the rhythm international after mm. me? Perhaps there is, I don't know. And what does that mean with this kind of, someone who comes in and doesn't believe in the things I believe in? You know, what, how is that possible? But if they don't believe in the things I believe in, all of that work gets put aside for a second and something new starts and who picks up that role. Mm. So we almost have to articulate in a better way what the majors, what the large pieces of funded infrastructure, arts infrastructure, what do they mean for the ecology? And how do we talk in a more um, coherent way about that, especially giving, given the, 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 well, 
the effective funding cuts that we're about to see with the, the four-year funded organisations, the, the states feeling absolutely squeezed, and that new writing being under threat through you know, not being invited into the kind of four-year conversation about ongoing funding. And there being no major organisation who's taken that up. Mm. How, you're, you're very well known, I would say, for being articulate and being public in your decisions, in talking about yourself and your career and your work. Is that something you had to learn? Is that always really been part of who you are as an artist? Or is that a, a mantle you think you've had to take on? Or uh, Look, look. I think being bicultural has always meant that every cultural expression is uh, has to be articulated. And you know, nothing against you know white people. Some of my best friends are white people. I've got nothing against them, but they sometimes live in a bubble where they don't have to go through the process of articulating their cultural experience because it's all around them. They see it in the the films and television and magazines and mm. theatre and all that stuff. So that there's not a kind of um, uh, attention built into their conversation. You know, it's interesting to see the the conversation around gender kind of coming to the fore and I go, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. But we actually need more than just the pointing out the problem. We need articulate solutions, mm. cultural solutions. And that's where I see we're, we're lots of things falling down. Um, and you know, it, admittedly, I don't think we're the perfect, we're not perfect, but how do we have conversations about it? Uh, there's an incredible defensiveness, which I think comes from an inarticulate um, leadership in the arts. And I'd say actually more bicultural, tricultural, multicultural yeah. kind of voices in leadership roles will create a, uh, an articulateness, uh, a development that everyone can benefit from. So I don't think I just, I, I, don't, I didn't appear overnight, but I, when my whole career, the 30 years of it now, has been about trying to negotiate where I fit in the world. And that's a lived experience as well as an artistic and cultural one. Mm. So more people who don't fit in might be useful. Yeah. Are they acts of translation, those conversations between cultures, or is it more, is it reframing? Is it trying to, you know, what can you illuminate from being in a big, you know, potentially kind of white institution like the Sydney Festival? Look, all of the above. I mean, I, I like to think that it's more interpretation rather than translation because sometimes cultural experiences will not get across. Yeah. So you are interpreting one for the other. Um, but also it takes a kind of boldness um, and, and a sense of purpose to what you're doing. So, you know, I come from a First Nations background. I never lied during the, in during the interview process that I was not going to do a First Nations kind of perspective on things. And when you deliver it, people expect it and it's there. And it's interesting that one of the shows, um, uh, Black Ties, is the highest daily, highest, highest selling show in, in the program so far. And we go, how is that possible? How is a large scale First Nations, well, comedy piece mm. in Sydney Town Hall, how is that the highest selling show so far? when you've got Isabella Gianni and you've got, you know, um, Joan Didion's The White Album and you've got all these kind of international big names, how is it that a First Nation, and you go, because I've been building it, yeah. or the festival's been building it before my time as well, but I've just shone a light on it and now people go, oh yeah, I'll go to that, that sounds, that sounds like a good thing to do. Hmm. In many ways, a festival says to an audience, come and see it the first time, you might feel comfortable, uncomfortable, you might feel a sense of tension around it. And the second time you'll go, oh yeah, I've seen something like that before. By the time you get to the third and fourth time, you go, yeah, that, oh yeah, I know about that. Oh yeah, I'll go see that. It becomes just what, it, what happens. What I worry about in our inarticulate kind of major theater companies, dance companies, all of them is that what ends up happening is they, they do something, but they do it in this kind of one-off kind of mm. fashion and you go actually that's fine you can do one off but what's the one what do you follow it up with and what yeah. do you follow it up after that and what about that after that and as I was saying before I know that the the flow of it all the the the, the chain of of development and stuff isn't always there because the people aren't you know able to go year on year on year on year but it's the job of us who can help 
artists achieve that too. Yeah. Anyway, easier said than done. So there's, so you know, there's a lot of First Nations world premieres and, and particularly Australian First Nations works in the festival. In terms of your experience in your career, how, what are the types of stories that that First Nations people are telling? You know, do they come in generations? Do they have movements? And and if they do, where might we be in what those stories are? Yeah, I mean. It, it's interesting that, um, you know, I did a show called Seven Stages of Grieving, you know, that show, and we looked at the different phases of Aboriginal history, and Deborah and I were talking about, ah, oh, we might be in the eighth phase, which is more about sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And in sovereignty, it means we're not in the translation process. You know, in reconciliation, we were trying to go, oh, let's come on board and try to mm -hmm. coax people into it and go through all that. And in the self-determination phase before then, it was trying to just tell our stories. So for me, um, from the 60s into the 70s, maybe in the 80s, it was very much about biographical and autobiographical stories, writing onto the public record our existence. Um, Just the sheer fact of, yeah. yeah. And, and to say, here we are, and we are determining our own voice in that way. And then I think it shifted into the 90s. You know, it's not a clean line, uh, where it was actually about talent identification about all those one person shows, mostly women, one woman shows that just jumped up and, you know, um, the trajectory then of those artists into, you know, like poor um, our friend Ningali, her, her pers one person show, Leah Purcell, Deborah mm -hmm. Malman, I mean, the, the list goes on of all these incredible women who jumped up and did things and showed that they had these uh, these vehicles through which we could shine. And even as a director, I think in the 90s, there was a real kind of energy to m create moments where Indigenous artists could shine. Then into the, in the 2000s and so, I think we start to take charge. You know, we become the directors, we run companies, we, you know, there's all of this kind of energy that was formed. Also, the, the three major indigenous theatre companies in, in the country step up and start to get more yeah. and more resourcing in the, in the 2000s. And where we are now in the, in the teens, the 20 teens, is our ambition has found, I think, a, a, a glass ceiling. Well, not so glass, I think it's maybe absolutely a kind of ceiling, a set of bars. And we're now going, ah, we've come to the party late. We want to have the kind of resources of a major organisation to be done on our terms, but that door seems to be locked to us. And Bangara is the only major organisation funded by the, the, the Australia Council in that way. And you go, now Ilbidri is ready to step in, yeah. or Yuriyakin's ready to step in, but the door seems barred. So it'd be interesting with all the changes, how that works. So, so to be honest, I just go biographical, autobiographical, star vehicles, this idea of lifting talent, then us being in charge. Mm -hmm. And into the future, I don't know, but I think it's, there's something to be said for what, uh, what we inherited in 1967 was a pan-Aboriginal experience. 67 was all about us banding together to make social change. And what we're seeing now in you know this part of the 21st century is saying actually we are so diverse. Mm. We are queer, we are young, we are urban, we are rural, we are remote, we are um, strong traditions, we are stolen generations, we are educated, we are incarcerated. That the diversity of voices are coming through and lots of the, the audience block are going, oh, oh, why can't you just be one? Why can't you yeah. all speak with the same voice? You go, because we're not. Yeah. And the sovereignty discussion that goes forward now about treaty and things will be saying, no, you've got, now got to treat, you've got to work with us, make treaty with us as individual clans and communities, rather than saying that there's a pan experience that, that uh, parallels the federal political system, yeah. which and is it not still that. obliterates and kind of oh, yeah, yeah. agglomerates and all that yeah, yeah, sort yeah. of stuff. Well, yeah. of everything, not just yeah. First Nations perspectives. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. So I was, I, mean, I was interested in works like The Visitors or, um, you know, Black Hawker Two or yeah. or your Black Drop Effect. Any of those works that seem to look back in time as or well. All the ones with black in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you said no themes though. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that seem to look back at a time and reposition and revoice or. Mm. Um, reconfigure it, and I think that's a really interesting uh, place for us to be. I'm thinking of, you know, Dark Emu, I'm thinking of yeah. works that certainly having come through kind of, you know, a suburban Australian education system, works that blow open 
our conception of how we were educated about the country sure, yeah, yeah, and yeah. what we were told about the country. And um, not that it was, you know, not that you're also responsible for educating yourself, but I'm fascinated by that complete re you know, revisioning of everything we thought we understood about. Yeah, uh, I think it's a trap, though, to think that these works that are reinterpreting historical perspectives are about history. Because mm. I think what they're, what we're doing is we're saying, actually, you've got to pull that history into the contemporary state of being. I mean, The Visitors is good for that because it's, it's, it's talking about um, you know, a group of First Nations people, Eora people, kind of coming together on January 26, 1788, and having a discussion whether they should let the boats land or not. <laughs> and you know, it's fabulous, but that's actually talking about sovereignty. Yeah. It's using as, as you know, uh, you think about the crucible, it's not really yeah. about the Salem, it's yeah. about McCarthyism, it's about its present day, and talking about this period of, well, you know, the anniversary, the, the Australia Day, is not really about the day. No. It's about us as a nation and us understanding sovereignty and where it comes from. So a historical perspective is important yeah. for that. Black Drop Effect is amazing. So Nadi Simpson, who I just have a lot of time for, where she's creating this um, conversation about, well, number one, Australia Day, the 26th of January, um, but also refer, referring to the anniversary of Cook and the 250th anniversary of, of Cook landing here. All and, the money that's been thrown and at And the that. money, <laughs> the, well, the money that literally gets taken from one and given to another. Uh, I had this great story at the Sutherland Shire, which is where Cook first yeah, landed. That's where I grew up. Oh, there you go, you know, the, you know the place. They changed, the councillors changed their logo to a face of Cook about oh, a couple of years ago, I think it was. And so all the garbage bins have a face of Cook on it now. And I go, oh, can you work that out? Can you work that out? Put the trash away. Anyway, um, but Black Drop Effect is where this story is, yes, about these characters and kind of interacting, but it's saying something that's metaphoric. The danger of a lot of First Nations, or the, the analysis of First Nations uh, conversations theatre, is that it can only be authentic if it is autobiographical or biographical. When in fact, we as artists have the same kind of creativity and imagination mm. as non-First Nations artists. And so we can create situations and create worlds around it that sound and act authentically. And so I think Nadi's doing a lot of that stuff as well. Yeah. And Black Ties, I was talking about this, is, is a lot of fun, <laughs> these two families kind of coming together, but it's the, oh, I should say that for, the, for the listener out there, that, or the viewer, the, the uh, you know, a, a Maori woman and an Aboriginal man marrying and their two families coming together. If you've ever been to an Aboriginal wedding or a Maori wedding, you know how volatile and how much fun that is. So, you know, and I think you could say that about almost any kind of big fat Greek wedding, yeah. any kind of, you know, all of that stuff as well. It's a lot of fun. And Black Hawk 2 treads a line between the, the present and the, and the past as well, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did. And Jeffrey Atherton, who's a non-Indigenous writer, is, is, has been fascinated by this material. And when we first met, I said to him, I think the danger is that you're going to tell a white story using black characters, which is a lot of the conversation around Secret River. Mm. You know, you have to tell a white story, and the only way you can tell it is if you have an Aboriginal presence there. And I said, actually, if I was to direct it, I said, this is before I chose to direct it, um, I would just cast the whole cast as Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal performers playing every role, so that every time a white character speaks racism, it is ironic. It has that kind of, or yeah, it's ironic, this kind of twist to it. Mm so that people see a black face, black face, uh, an Aboriginal face, saying these words and are already confronted by the words and the ownership by this actor and, you know, so there's already tensions yeah. in there. It's a fascinating story too, Black Hocker too, which yeah. is again not a, um, not well known. Do you, do you mind telling yeah, us a bit about it? In, in 1868, um, uh, Charles Lawrence, who is an English cricketer, uh, formed a team of Aboriginal players uh, in fact, inherited a bit of a team and took them to England to tour and play the English for like a six month period during the English summer. And the first time they had to be smuggled out of the colony of Victoria at the time because they they weren't allowed to leave. You know, they, you know, and they didn't get the permissions and all that kind of stuff. And off they did. And they they won 14 games, lost 14 games and drew the rest. And this kind of sense of their experience over there. Um, in many ways, I did a play called Black Diggers, which had some similar themes for me, which is 
why do Aboriginal men take this opportunity to go and explore somewhere else? In one case, war, but this case, cricket. And why go and face the coloniser head on in a game that they had, knew all the rules for? You know, the colonisers, you know, torture the rules to control you, yeah. and then you go and beat them at it. I love that. At Lords of all places, oh, yes. too. Yeah. And, and this wonderful thing where that that the the cricketers are uh, they they're winning, they're doing all that kind of stuff, but they are empowered because they make choices about this stuff. And anyway, for me, I think that that. Cricket is a wonderful metaphor, and, and as a play, you get the cricket nuts, you get the <laughs> First Nation kind of supporters, you get theatre people all coming to the theatre together. I think, yeah, bring it on, bring That's it on. That's great. And, and, a, a, um, and a, the 30th anniversary of Brand New Day yeah. in the festival as well, which yeah. is extraordinary. Uh, 30 years. Opera Australia. I know, Opera Australia. It's interesting, isn't it, like this, I love when big mainstream companies kind of embrace something that's out of their comfort zone. And we're, we're partnering with Opera Australia to do that, to do Brand New Day, and then it's touring, it's going to the Perth Festival as well. It's brilliant, and it's one of those things you go, us together alleviate some of the um, nervousness around that, because you know, we can help back it and make yeah. it all happen and stuff like that too. So, And you know, Uncle Jimmy who passed away, oh, a few years ago now, um, and we just talked about Ningali Lawford before, um, and she was in the original production oh, wow. of Brand New Day in Broome all those years ago. I'm not going to say it was the beginning of her career, but it f I, think, I think it was. I think it was her first big show that she'd yeah. done. That's mm. amazing. It's so exciting. And we, interestingly enough, a few years ago I interviewed uh, the three writers that are part of the True West program, yeah. um, including James Alazi whose play Lady Tabuli is on uh, Out West. In, yeah. And um, is that uh, been a deliberate engagement with that those writers and that, that, those companies? Is that, how has that been for you in the festival? Well, the, um, for the past few years, the festival has been focused on circus in Parramatta in particular and building audiences up. And it's interesting that the, a number of stakeholders out there have been saying, actually, we think it's time for our voices. We need uh, a platform for our voices, and the National Theatre of Parramatta has been really great at all that stuff, um, like developing up voices and showing audiences their own experiences and community. Uh, and then saying, okay, let's look at new commissions and new work. And so National Theatre of Parramatta doing the True West program of readings of new works of which Lady Tabuli is part of. But also, oh, you know, it's only two years ago when the, um, the, the national plebiscite on uh, same-sex marriage was there, and Western Sydney was a real outlier in terms of acceptance of same-sex marriage. And s the idea that Lady Tabuli, it's not a direct parallel, but there's a conversation there about saying, how do you accept difference when you are already different? You know, you, you are already seen as an outsider to the dominant culture. And then when you choose to be even further out, because you come out as, in this case, you know, a, a queer man, a gay man, this, this story of no, stay in, stay in the boundaries, stay within your cultural family, I think that's, that's a, a, mm. an interesting point. And, you know, again, when I talked earlier about when you're bicultural, tricultural, multicultural, there's a real sense of don't choose too many things to be a minority in, you know. I'm a gay Aboriginal man from Queensland, how far, how far do you want to go? But there's a point where, you know, sometimes families only have bandwidth for certain acceptances and it takes generations and it takes role modelling to get you to where you need to get to. Mm. And Lady to is beautiful. James has done a, a, a great job. And Dino, who's the, the oh, director, oh man, Dino. Dino. <laughs> I mean, that man, truly, <laughs> he, he, he has no fear. He <laughs> just goes straight into everything, back to back, psh, makes it all happen. It's great. Yeah, it's obviously working for him, I think. I think so. And, and obviously Anthem as well, which is, you yeah. know, uh, um, almost iconic before it arrived in the world, just yeah. by the kind of cultural value of who's afraid of the working class. And those writers. Yeah. When you think about Patricia Cornelius, Melissa Reeves, Andrew Bavell, uh, Christos Chokas, Irini yeah. Vella, you go, oh my God, these yeah. people, 20 years ago, they may have been not as well known. Now they're so out there. Yeah. And saying things that no one else is prepared to say. I mean, this I, I'm a bit kind of cheesed off actually, 
about going, this is the kind of show that a major theatre company should have got behind. Why? What, what scared them off? Mm. Why is it that we, we can't have these voices? And going back to this conversation around the development opportunities for writers and, and the, the funding squeeze that's happening in writer development, does it mean that only the middle class and upper middle class voices will be heard because they are the only writers who can be supported, yeah. that, that can self-support or, or whatever, and that good, strong working class voices, uh, and I'm not saying all those writers are working class, but that's, you know, there's a certain background that yeah. they understand, that there's a there's part of me goes, where are those voices? Because our theatre has the danger of becoming more and more isolated mm. from the bulk of the nation if we become whiter, more male, you know, um, rigid in the kind of things we're prepared to go to as an audience as well. We need to keep active because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you only see yourself reflected, then you expect yourself to be reflected. If you see a diversity on stages, then you understand that there's a diversity in your lived world. Yeah. How do you mean, how do you navigate that long, how, how conscious of it when you're navigating the long-term development of an audience? You know, not just audiences aren't passive and to be taught, but how do you, how aware of that conversation are you? I, I want to take you from here to there. How did that work? Is it just yeah. sort of sales and feedback? Is it a, a sort of vibe you gather over the year? How yeah, does it... I think it starts with your own fascination. If, if in my case, I'm fascinated by those voices, mm. I think those voices are interesting. They remind me of my family. And so I connect with them. I, you know, I not, don't get me wrong. I love a good, well, uh, David Williamson's fantastic. Yeah. I love David, you know, I love his work. And he, he's actually diversified a lot too, to be honest. Um, but you know, or, or Joanna Murray Smith has fantastic kind of strong middle class and upper middle class voices. I'm not saying don't have them. I'm saying put them in context mm. to our, our, the expression of our culture. And what I've loved about, let's say you look to the UK in particular, where there's a highly funded infrastructure and a highly commercial infrastructure, and sometimes things pop from one to the other, but you don't stop taking the risks. Yeah. And every now and then something surprises you. Something, you know, um, come from away pops up. Well, not that that's English, but it pops yeah. up and you go, oh, that surprises me and suddenly it's a sellout success because a starved audience is a hungry audience. And if you feed them, suddenly they, they know they can come to, in this case, theater or film or yeah. whatever. I mean, I loved, I mean, you know, Black Panther, <laughs> you know, I go, yeah, 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 bring it on. Uh, and it was interesting that you look at the sales figures for Black Panther where yes, Africa, as you would expect, but also through Asia, there was high sales and that, that, you know, the sequels and things will all come from the fact that a non-Anglo audience loved it because it was thumbing its nose at the colonizer. It gave people of color power. Mm. And I go, theater can do that in this country. Why don't we do that? That's fun. Yeah. And on that, how do you, how, how do you connect these new works that you're making? You know, there's a, almost a responsibility or certain, a, a, um, you know, joy in having so many new Australian works. How do you connect them outwards past the festival and, and past their first lives? Yeah, it's difficult. I, I think, um, uh, look, it's horses for courses too. Some things, like the major festivals initiative is great, where lots of festivals getting together to, to, to make work possible. Um, also looking at touring kind of relationships. Unfortunately, the festival is its own time, and that can be a difficult you know, thing because yeah. the organisation doesn't often think beyond its own time in January. Um, but it, by partnering with people, you can actually, uh, with organisations, they can take charge of it yeah. a bit more and go I'm thinking like Laser Beak Man will, uh, you yeah. know, these well, sort but of that, works. That that's will... a great example of the Brisbane Festival and La Boite championing that work early and Dead Puppet Society then piecing together a tour that we can then be part of and that Sydney deserves to see the work of the rest of the country. Mm. You know, Colossus being another example, or dance work in this case. But Laser Big Man, you know, with Tim Sharp and, and these, the, you know, the imagination of Tim Sharp is great. And, and Dead Puppet Society, those, those guys are, are thoughtful and um, imaginative and adventurous, you know, taking a story like that to the people's great. Yeah. And, and for me, I think that when we talked about diversity earlier, you know, we don't often think of disability. We don't think of yeah neurodiversity. Neurodiversity yeah, in this case, yeah. uh, but also we we created a uh, disability programming initiative, where we're saying to to 
artists who are living with a disability bring your ideas because our audiences should see them. They should see you on stage. They should see your disability and not be defined by it, but by also see that this, in terms of Tim's um, example, Tim Sharp's example, you know, see your imagination at play and realise that you have something to offer us, to free us up perhaps too, from different ways of thinking. Mm. And I think Laser Big Man's great for that. It's great. How do you as an artistic director, I mean, you, you know, you've programmed and led some really amazing companies. Does your style of access change? How do people get to you? Do you try and maintain a, you know, yeah. it, it, it's a realistic challenge that there's yeah. few resources and few people who can make things happen. How do you balance? I, I try to encourage everyone to be bold. Um, you know, have a meeting, grab a meeting with me, grab me in a foyer, have a conversation with me, but also realise that you have to be in, uh, interrogated or your idea is interrogated through my lens as well. It's not like you get an easy ride. <laughs> just because you're a black fella doesn't mean you're just going to get in the Sydney Festival like that. You've got to jump through some hoops. You've got to be ambitious. You've got to be bold in lots of different ways. Um, and also accept that sometimes now's not your time. Maybe next year's your time or stuff. I remember when I was at the Queensland Theatre Company in my first, I think it was six months, maybe a bit longer, um, I met with over 300 artists. By the, the end of my time, I could maybe only have given jobs to about 50 or 60 people. So I, uh, my, my saying is that I'm the purveyor of more disappointment than I am joy. <laughs> but you know, you don't know unless you give it a go. Yeah. And you've got to be tough. There is a, it's a tough out there and not everyone's going to make it. I accept that and you know, I don't know why I'm here but some people need championing, you know, and to champion someone like um, uh, like James and his play and Dino or um, a First Nations artist who's who's getting their work up and has something really important to say, that's just as important as an, for an artistic director to go seeking those people who have a voice that's maybe been neglected. Yeah, and making sure that you're balancing the discovery and the championing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks so much for talking to us today, Thanks, Wesley. John. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure as always.